<clears throat> now, there are a number of phrases and different things that are used in the teaching of scriptures. You know, sometimes we could go and we could think about the times where Jesus asked the question, have you not read? And those are, that's a good study. Or Paul's trustworthy statements that he has. And even the times in which throughout the scriptures, um, analogies are used in regard to farming. Tonight I want us to think about Jesus' use of fig trees, as he used it on several occasions, and each one seems to kind of give us a different lesson that make application to our lives and how we can live better for him. You know, the first that we see is this one that was just read just a moment ago, and that this probably is really right at the beginning of Jesus' ministry, so sequentially this one's probably right where it's supposed to be. Jesus has just returned from being tempted after having been baptized. He spent 40 days in the wilderness being tempted. He has now returned, and these are the events that take place very shortly after that point. And so we're very early in the ministry of Jesus, and he comes, you know, he sees Nathanael coming. Philip's bringing him, but he sees Nathanael coming, and he gives great praise to this man. He says, Behold, an Israelite indeed, one in whom there is no deceit. And so that's very high praise for Jesus to give to this man that is coming. And, and you know, Nathanael is kind of seems taken back by what Jesus says there, and and he says, how do you know me? You know, how can you make such a statement about me? How do you know me? And he says, I saw you under the fig tree before Philip came to you. Now, we're not given all the insight into Nathaniel's time under the fig tree. I can tell you, having grown up, that you can be under a fig tree and no one else can see you. It, they'll hang over onto the ground at, at certain sizes and... I had one when I was growing up in our yard that was like that, and so he could have very well known that no one else could have known he was there. Because in Nathaniel's mind, when Jesus makes this statement that I saw you under the fig tree, it's all he needs. He recognizes it as a miracle. He says, truly you are the Son of God. He recognizes Jesus as the Messiah. And so we see here that Jesus, and, and when we're thinking about the fig tree in this particular occasion, it might be, you know, we might be able to say that it's incidental, and it kind of is. But it's a part of a lesson that Jesus teaches. And, and the lesson is that Jesus knows us. He knows our secret places. He knows what's going on in those parts of our hearts and our minds and in our lives that maybe no one else knows, but Jesus knows it. And we can be just as amazed, and we should be just as amazed that Jesus does know those things. And that should also give us great comfort to look at him. You know, I'm kind of amazed that Jesus looks at this as not that big a deal. He says to Nathaniel, he says, that really, that impresses you? That I saw you under the fig tree, that's all it took? I mean, you think about what Jesus is going to go through in his ministry, right? He's going to raise people from the dead, and people are going to look at it and go, so what? He's going to heal every sick person that comes in front of him, and they're going to go, I still don't believe. And here is a guy that all Jesus had to do is say, I saw you under the fig tree, and he immediately says, you're the Son of God. I guess Jesus' praise was right, wasn't it? This truly was a good man that when presented with the facts, presented with an apparent miracle, clear miracle, probably one of Jesus' first, he was willing to then believe unlike so many of his brethren. But Jesus says, you know, you're impressed with this. I'm going to tell you what, you're going to see far more. There's going to be much greater things that I'm going to do as angels ascend and descend upon me as I work the power that has been given to me from heaven. Well, the second fig tree instance we see is the parable of the fig tree. And really what we're thinking about here is Jesus is going to be talking about trusting in what God says. Matthew chapter 24, verses 32 to 33, along with uh, sister text in Mark 13 and Luke 21. Jesus is on the Mount of Olives 
with his disciples. And when you sit on the Mount of Olives, you look across the Valley of Kedron, and there would have been the temple complex. You know, it's very possible that it could easily be considered one of the seven wonders of the world for that time frame. It was incredible, Herod's temple was. It was made out of a, a type of stone that had a crystalline content that when the sun shone on it, you would not. it was hard to look at because it would shine so bright. And so there is this amazing complex, this amazing building sitting across the valley from them, and they're sitting there and they're talking about how amazing it is. Look at the buildings. And Jesus makes an astounding statement to them. As they look at the very center and the very heart of Judaism, he says, not one stone will be left upon another. It's going to be destroyed. And the disciples really have a hard time with what Jesus is saying. And so Jesus moves forward there in Matthew chapter 24, and he provides the signs for the upcoming destruction of Jerusalem to his disciples. Now, a lot of people get these signs mixed up with, you know, Jesus' return, but that's not what he's talking about. From there through verse 34, he is talking about the destruction of Jerusalem. And in verse 32, he says, Learn from the parable of the fig tree. So he's given these signs. And he says, basically, you can look at that fig tree and you can know summer is upon us, right? That it would be something that would tell you the change of season. And as certain as the signs of the changing seasons were, the signs that Jesus had given them in regard to the destruction of Jerusalem were just as reliable for all believers. And they would happen exactly as Jesus said. And the early church would have those things to see and to know as that day come near. Now, you get down toward the end of it, and, and it does, and it's another sermon for another time, but he does talk about the end of time, but he doesn't give any signs. So let's never get confused about that. Another fig, instance of a fig tree being used is when Jesus talks about figs from thorns. And... We see this in Luke chapter 6 and verses 44 and 45. Also, we see it in Matthew chapter 7 and verse 16. So basically, we're looking at the sister text. Both Luke 6 and Matthew chapter 7 are both talking about the Sermon on the Mount. And Jesus says, For each tree is known by its own fruit. For men do not gather figs from thorns, nor do they pick grapes from a briar bush. The good man out of the good treasure of his heart brings forth what is good and the evil man out of the evil brings treasure I'm sorry out of the evil treasure brings forth what is evil for his mouth speaks from that which fills his heart you know the lesson that Jesus is teaching here is that good cannot come from evil I can't live however I want to live, live in opposition to God, and then turn around and say, I'm good. It doesn't work like that. No more than, you know, a fig will come from a thorny bush. You're going to have to be, you're going to bear the fruit of what you are. If you are a good tree, you're going to bear good fruit. If you're a bad tree, that's how Matthew 7 puts it, you're going to bear bad fruit. And we are judged by our fruits. In fact, in Matthew chapter 7, Jesus goes right into that after talking about this, that there are people that are going to claim they're good, but they're not living good. And he said, they're going to come to me in the judgment day, and they're going to say, Lord, Lord, did we not do this, and did we not do that in your name? And he's going to say, I never knew you. See, they did some good things. They were religious people. But Jesus is going to say, I never knew you because you did not do the will of my Father which is in heaven. That makes for good fruit. And they weren't bearing it. So good cannot come from evil. Good actions come from good people, people of God. And we need to remember that as we go forward, as we think about how a tree bears fruit. And our lives are to be lives, according to Colossians chapter 1, that bear fruit for God. We also see Jesus in the parable of the barren tree barren fig tree. In Luke chapter 13, in verses 1 through 9, he says, Now on the same occasion there were some present who reported to him about the Galileans whose blood Pilate mixed with their sacrifices. And Jesus said to them, Do you suppose 
that these Galileans were greater sinners than all other Galileans because they suffered this fate? Because remember, if bad things happened to you, they kind of thought you kind of deserved it probably. Do you really think that they were any worse than any other Galilean because Pilate sent the Roman soldiers in and killed them in the temple courtyard and their blood mixed with their sacrifices? He says, I tell you, no. But unless you repent, you will likewise perish. He says, or do you suppose that those 18 on whom the tower in Siloam fell and killed were worse culprits than all the men who live in Jerusalem? I tell you, no. Except you repent, you will likewise perish. And he began telling this parable. A man had a fig tree which had been planted in his vineyard, and he came looking for fruit on it, and it did not, and he did not find any. And he said to the vine keeper, Behold, for three years I have come looking for fruit on this fig tree without finding any. Cut it down. Why does it even use up the ground? And he answered and said to him, Let it alone, sir, for this year too, until I dig around it and put in fertilizer. And if it bears fruit next year, fine. And if not, cut it down. I love that parable. You know, as God looks at us, if we're not people bearing fruit, he's asking that kind of question, isn't he? Are we just a waste of ground? A waste of life without fruit? Verses 1 through 5, as we try to understand what Jesus is saying in this parable, when we go back to those uh, Galileans that were killed by Pilate, the 18 on whom the tire of Siloam fell, the key teaching of this text is repent or perish. That's the point that Jesus is trying to get across to us. Verses 6 through 9, when we look at the parable, we have to remember that. That's what he's teaching. A parable is, well, it comes from two, two words, parabole. Para means alongside, like parallel, right? Bole means uh, to cast. And so the word parable literally means to cast alongside. In other words, I'm going to teach something, and then I'm going to cast something alongside of it to illustrate it, to show it to you. And that's what Jesus is doing here as he tells this parable. He's casting it alongside of this teaching that we must repent or we will perish with all those that will not repent. The fig, the fig tree, rather, um, in the story is the Jews. They have not been faithful to God. They have not borne any fruit for God in their lives. The Jews are being given, though, one final chance to repent. Jesus is that, is that vine, vineyard ten, per, uh, tender. I can get that right in a minute. He is that person tending the vineyard. And... He is the one saying, just let me work with it. And he's talking about his ministry. He's saying, let me dig around it. Let me fertilize it. Let me, let me give teaching to it. And maybe these people will come around and repent. Just let me do that. And if they won't, then they'll be cut down. But maybe they'll bear fruit. Isn't that a beautiful picture of Jesus? just wanting to give us another chance, just wanting to take some more time to teach us, to help us. It really kind of gives us insight into Peter's statement about God being long-suffering, not wishing for any of us to perish, but for all to come to repentance. But Jesus tells this story and makes a beautiful picture of the love that he had for these people. He wants to give them one more chance. And that's the chance in his ministry. They reject him. They will be cut down. They will perish. And today we have the opportunity to hear the gospel. But my friends, if we will not repent, we will likewise perish. And we too will be cut down by Jesus. We will be cut off. But he has done everything that he can to provide the best ground possible for us to bear fruit. But it's up to us to do it. I think the final one is the one that we read it and we kind of struggle with it. And that is the time in which Jesus curses the fig tree. That, that's kind of a hard one um, because we have to really look at what's going on around it in the text to really get what Jesus is saying. This is found in Matthew chapter 21, verses 18 through 22. 
as well as Mark 11, and we'll be looking at Mark 11. The events that are taking place here, this is the last week of Jesus' life. He's in the last week. He's on Monday. He will die on Friday. This is Monday of that week. And so he is shuttling back and forth to Jerusalem from Bethany. The day before, he came from Bethany, came over the Mount of Olives, and he had what we call the triumphant entry, right, where he rode in on the, on the donkey. And so that has happened. And he has returned and he has come back. Verse 11 says, Jesus entered Jerusalem and came into the temple, and after looking around at everything, he left for Bethany with the twelve since it was already late. So based on what is going to happen the very next morning, we can't skip this verse. Because what happened the very next morning tells us that this looking around that Jesus did in the temple wasn't good. And I'm not certain as I read the scriptures and I look at the times, you know, I don't know how many exact times we have of Jesus cleansing the temple, but there's not just one. There's multiple times. This one's at the very end. John records one at the very beginning. I almost think Jesus did it every time he walked in the temple because I don't think Jesus ever got okay with it. He never became desensitized to what was happening in his father's house. He walks in, he looks around, he's not happy. He's not happy with what he sees going on there. Verse 12, on the next day, When they had left Bethany, so here they come again. They're coming from Bethany over the Mount of Olives, across the Valley of Kidron, and right to the temple. uh, Temple's on that side of Jerusalem. He became hungry. Seeing at a distance a fig tree and leaf, he went to see if perhaps he would find anything on it. And when he came to it, he found nothing but leaves, for it was not the season for figs. And he said to it, May no one ever eat fruit from you again. And his disciples were listening. That's important for later. Now, even though it is early, the tree looked like it should have fruit on it. It was in in leaf, as the scriptures say. But upon close inspection, it does not have any fruit. And there are some people out there that look at this text, and they see Jesus, and they kind of think he's being spoiled, that he's throwing a little bit, that that he's angry, he's pitching a little bit of a, a fit. But it's really quite different than that. He's not angry. He is setting up to make a point concerning what is about to happen that very week with his death. The next event is key to understanding this action by Jesus. Verse 15. Then they came to Jerusalem. So he curses that tree and they go on into the city of Jerusalem. And he entered the temple and began to drive out those who were buying and selling in the temple and overturned the tables of the money changers and the seats of those who were selling doves. And he would not permit anyone to carry merchandise through the temple. And he began to teach and say to them, Is it not written, My house shall be called a house of prayer for all the nations? But you have made it a robber's den. I mean, Jesus isn't angry here. I think we get that idea when we see him throwing over the table. He's, he's dumping it out. He's running the animals out. He's keeping people from coming through with those things. But he's teaching while he's doing this. The temple was supposed to be a house of prayer. It looked like a house of prayer. Had all the trappings of a house of prayer. But it was a robber's den. Verse 19. When evening came, they would go out of the city. And we know that. We're going to see that on Thursday night when they go to the Garden of Gethsemane. But as they were passing by in the morning the next day, they saw the fig tree withered from the roots up. Being reminded, Peter said to him, Rabbi, look, the fig tree which you cursed has withered. And Jesus answered, saying to them, Now, these are texts that we know very well, but these texts have to do with this withered, cursed fig tree. Have faith in God. Truly I say to you, whoever says to this mountain, be taken up and cast into the sea and does not doubt in his heart, but believes that what he says is going to happen, it will be granted him. Therefore I say to you, all things for which you pray and ask, believe that you have received them, and they will be granted you. 
Whenever you stand praying, forgive, if you have anything against anyone, so that your Father who is in heaven will also forgive you your transgressions. The temple, as Jesus curses this fig tree, that's the temple. The temple is the fig tree, and it looks like a house of prayer, just like the fig tree looked like it would have fruit, but it's not. And the curse of the fig of the tree by Jesus exemplifies the end of the temple, which begins here with Jesus' denouncements, and at the end of the week will be concluded with the tearing of the veil from the top to the bottom, opening up the temple and ending that being the place where worship is to be. Ending that that's the exclusive place to go to God. And so that is what is coming. That is because it has ceased to be that house of prayer. The temple would no longer function in that capacity, but the true disciples, Jesus is saying here, will now function in that capacity. They will bring, be able to say their, they, they will be able to bring prayers to God. So as we think about an application of this one to us today, do we wear the green leaves of Christianity? Do we kind of look like one? But we don't bear any fruit. We don't bear fruit in our life for Christ. That's very much like the fig tree Jesus came upon that day. Many say they are Christians but do very little to be like Jesus Christ by obeying His words. Sometimes churches claim to serve God while disregarding His will. Such have leaves but no fruit. Such look like places of prayer, but they're really not. They're taking from God. They're robbing Him by saying things that He never said. Such people in churches will be cursed. Such people in churches will die. Revelation would term it in regard to congregations or churches, would regard it as having that candlestick removed from you. So as we think about these fig trees tonight, lessons for us, Jesus knows you. He knows he sees you under your fig tree wherever that may be. He sees you in your secret places. He knows your hurts, your weaknesses, your difficulties, and your needs, and he cares. We also see that God means what He says. If God says something, you can count on it to happen. As hard as it was to believe that God would destroy the temple, He said it and it happened. Even going back, even if you just disregard Matthew 24 and what Jesus says about the destruction of Jerusalem, they had the same problem all the way back in the day of Jeremiah. They said there's no way that the temple can ever be destroyed because that's, you know, Jerusalem can't be destroyed because this is where God's temple is. But yet God had said that's exactly what was going to happen. But they didn't want to hear it. But God means what He says. And we had better learn that lesson. Another thing is that you are what is within your heart. Are you seeking to serve God with all of your heart? Do you love Him with all of your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind, with all your strength? You realize when Jesus gives that great commandment there and he designates that as that greatest commandment, he, what he's talking about is I love him with everything I am. Nothing left out. It's all his. We also learn that all of us must change. Every single one of us must repent or we will perish spiritually. No one is exempt from this requirement. Christianity requires you to become something radically different than what you were before you were baptized. And you're going to spend the rest of your life, after you come up out of the watery grave of baptism, you're going to spend the rest of your life continuing to radically change your life to be more like the Savior you serve. It is a life of constant change. But it makes us so much better. If only we will. Jesus knows 
what you need tonight. You know what you need tonight. I don't. Uh, I, you know, I wouldn't even presume to know what you need. But I know what I need. And Jesus knows what I need. Can we help you with what you need? We hope we can, and we hope you will let us help bear much help help bear much fruit, and in so doing, be pleasing to Christ. We want to help you with that. We want. I need help with that. I need that encouragement. I need that building up. That's why the church is so very important, because we need that. I don't know what your needs are tonight, but maybe it's a need that you feel like you need your church family to help you with. And we stand ready to assist. If you want to be more than just a fruitless Christian that just has leaves, if you want to be more than that, and you've got to be more than that if you want to be right. You've got to be more than that if you do not want to be that person Jesus was talking about in Matthew chapter 7 when he says, And some will say to me, Lord, Lord, didn't we do all these things? Yeah, but you didn't do what I told you to do. Maybe that's you. And if it is... The Lord calls for you as he did that day. He gave that parable of the fig tree. He calls for you to repent. Why? So you will not perish. That's the last thing he wants to see for any of us. And I think everyone in this auditorium, that's the last thing we want to see happen to anyone here. So let us help you. Won't you? As we stand in his name. Let's rise up and build the name of